Good morning, church. Stand with us this morning as we begin to worship today. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory. The King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Good morning, church. Welcome to Green Ridge this morning. Welcome to everybody who's watching on the live stream. We are uh, so glad that you have chosen to worship the Lord with us this morning. The last couple weeks, uh, Pastor Mark has been introducing us to a new vision, a new direction for the church. And it's really founded on this statement that here at Green Ridge, we are exiles, exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. That's it's who we are as God's people. That's what we are about. And 
Part of that today is that we are singing about how awesome God is, what he has done for us. We're going to read some passages of scripture that describe his goodness to us. Then we're going to hear the word of God proclaimed to us. All of that is a part of exalting God. And that's what we want to be about this morning. Our prayer is that today blesses you, that it lifts your soul, and that it brings you closer to the Lord. I invite you to, to put your hands out this morning, kind of palms up, and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together to, to get our hearts into a posture of worship. Say this prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God who's never failed will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. Praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. So oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will. sake he made him 
to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself, carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners. Some from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body, the bread, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out all for love. And the whole earth trembled, and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins 
At the foot of the cross Where grace and suffering meet You have shown me your love Through the judgment you received And you've won my heart And you've won my heart Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty And wear forgiveness like a crown Coming to kiss the feet of mercy, I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross, where I am made complete. You have given me life Through the death you bore for me And you've won my heart And you've won my heart Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty And wear forgiveness like a crown Coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down At the foot of the cross I trade these ashes in for beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown Coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down I lay every burden down I lay every burden down the foot of the cross. Church, let's say this together. This is what Moses wrote to the people of Israel, just describing who this God is and our response to him, what it should be. Say this out loud with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. God, help us to be the people of God who always remember you who are always thinking about how we can love you well with heart, mind, body. Bless the rest of this service, God, that you may be praised well and that we would be built up. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, church.
thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, my sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. Good morning again, church. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to John chapter 4. I've said this before several times, uh, but I'll say it again. If you need a Bible, let me know. 
I'm happy to give you one. Um, if you know someone who needs a Bible, I can definitely uh, resource you for that and get them in different languages. I, can, I found a good large print if you need one. So just let me know. John 4, beginning verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town. And said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Good morning, church. We are on our last Sunday in our series called Restore. And uh, over the past three weeks, we have been talking about the future, the future of our church. Our church is coming up on a whole lot of transitions and new things, and, and there's a lot going on. And as we look to the future, we have looked back at God's Word, and we've said, what does God say His church should be? So that as we move into this next season, we are making sure we're standing where He wants us to be. And so uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we have drawn out from that text uh, some ideas about who God wants his people to be, that we are, what we've been saying, that we are exiles who are exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. And that's actually what we're rallying around as we look to the future. That's what we're going to be making sure our ministries are lining up with and doing. It's an, it's an important thing for us. And so I, I want to kind of test you. Go ahead and look at somebody next to you and try to say that by memory. Let's see. And make fun of each other for failing. Go for it. Be kind. (laughs) 
I heard some groaning. Good, good. The notes are on the board. It's right there. All right, so we've also been looking at sort of a a timeline for us, a roadmap of where we're going over the next uh, five-ish now months. And one of the things that we've said is that September, the second Sunday in September, is going to be our grand reopening Sunday. We're We're just doing it, right? We don't know what the world or future will hold then, but we're hoping that with vaccine rollouts and all of that, we'll be at a better place. And whatever the world is like at that point, we are just saying, Lord, we don't want to press pause forever on our children's ministry and on the various things that matter a lot here. And so we're just going to pick this day and move forward. So second Sunday in September is our grand reopening. We're just pushing forward on that. Uh, May is going to be a month where we seek the Lord together in prayer, where we ask Him to do what only He can do to prepare us and lead us well. And then the summer months are going to be a time of of getting ready. So we will be recruiting and asking for volunteers and bothering you to sign up for children's ministry. And, And we will be training you and we will be getting everyone back in shape and trying some things out. In August, we're going to invite, invite, invite. In September, we're going to hit the ground running. Amen? Woo! We're excited. Um, we've, also, we've also said, hey, big thing, big thing is coming. We're going to move to two services. So in, on the second Sunday of September, we're going to have two services. Green Ridge actually used to have two services. I think used to have three at one point. Very cool. They tried a Saturday night service for a while. But we're going to move back to this two-service idea. And here's, here's the big thing that you're going to hear from us over and over. Sunday is a two-hour thing. <laughs> we want everyone to come for both because we want you to attend one and serve one. Attend one and, and plug in somewhere, whether it's an equipped class or serving in children's ministry or helping with something else. We want everyone to be playing that two-hour role so that you can be a part of what we're doing and experience what we're doing so that other people too, right, our children's ministry workers who have been so faithful for so long and missed out on big church because no one else would relieve them for that second hour. No, we're going we're gonna to make it so that everyone can be a part of this, and it's going to be great. And so I know you're with me on that, right? You're with me. It's going to be a two-hour thing. Two hours is what we're doing for the good of the whole church. Yes, all right. Now today, today we are going to wrap up our, our looking forward as we uh, get into the goal, the goal portion of we are exiles exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. We talked about our identity as exiles, our actions exalting God and exerting good, and today we're talking about our goal that our neighbors would experience Jesus. And so, we're actually going to look at this story from John chapter 4. Pastor Paul read it to you. I am going to invite you, so open your Bibles to John 4, and I am going to recap this story, and we're going to let this be a master's class on evangelism from Jesus. We're going to just learn some of the tips and tricks of how he talks to this woman about salvation. But at the very end, we're going to look back at the beginning of the story and the end of the story. And we're going to learn there are two key ways that our neighbors experience Jesus. So let's jump into this this morning. In verses 1 through 4, we saw that Jesus is heading from the south to the north, and he will pass through Samaria. Israel is sort of like a vertical strip of a country, right? And so he's going from south where Jerusalem, Judea is, and he's going all the way up to the north where certain cities in Galilee are. There's uh, places like Capernaum are up there. And so he has to pass through Samaria. This is a trip from Texas to North Dakota, but just much smaller. Israel's a tiny place. So he's going from Texas to North Dakota, and he's got to pass through South Dakota. He has to go through Samaria. Something you need to know about Samaria, though, is that, and you heard it as Pastor Paul read, the Jews and the Samaritans do not get along. They do not talk to each other. They do not do things together. They do not sing kumbaya. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and it's super complicated, but there's two big reasons. There is an ethnic divide between them, and there is a theological divide between them. The ethnic divide, the Jews thought of the Samaritans as kind of not being fully Jewish. They have a lot of uh, mixed kind of genealogy stuff. Their family tree split off a while ago, and they're they're not totally Jews in many of their eyes. This is 
This is not good, by the way, just to be clear, and we're going to see Jesus doesn't care about this divide. There's a theological divide between the Samaritans and the Jews as well, because the, the Jews rightly, because God said so, the Jews rightly believe that the center of what God is doing is in Jerusalem at the temple. The Samaritans believe, no, the center of what God is doing is a mountain in Samaria, and that's where everything is supposed to go down. And so there's a theological argument between them. And so they don't get along. They don't sing Kumbaya. Jesus has to, as a Jewish man, go through Samaria where people don't really get along. Verses 5 through 7, he gets there and he is beat. It tells us that it's the, I think it says the sixth hour, which is actually noon which is the 12th hour for us. It's weird. They counted time differently. So it's noon, and he's under the noon sun. He has been walking all morning. He gets to a well. He sends his own disciples into the village to go get food, and he is thirsty, and here comes a woman to visit the well. She's got a jar to draw water. If we were ancient Jews, this would ring some bells for us. It would be a lot like going to McDonald's and ordering a McGriddle at 2 p.m. That's the wrong time for that. And so she is coming to the well at the wrong time of day. Why is it the wrong time? Well, because the well is pretty far outside of the village, and so you've got to grab these jugs, and you've got to carry them all the way to the well. Then you have to do the hard work of filling a bucket with water and pulling it up the well. That's hard work. You lift water all day. That's hard. Pour it into the jars, and then under the hot noon sun, carry those things back to your house. This is hard work. Why add the sun to it? So most people would go and do this. The women of the village would usually go together in the wee hours of the morning. There's enough light to see, but it's not hot yet. So little weird alarm bells in this story. Why is this woman coming at noon? What is her deal? Verses 7 through 9 tell us that when Jesus looks at her and asks her, hey, would you give me some water? She's shocked. How could you, a Jewish man, talk to me, a Samaritan woman? See, the, the divides are coming into play. There's this ethnic divide. There's this theological divide. Our people don't talk. And there's also a gender divide here, right? It was strange for a grown man to talk to a grown woman who was not his sister, mother, or wife, okay? That was strange. And it was so strange that if anyone saw them, they'd be thinking, what is this rabbi up to? What are your intentions with this woman? We know that for sure because later at the end of the story, did you hear what the disciples thought? When they saw Jesus, they thought this, but nobody dared ask it. What is he after? Why is he talking to her? What are your intentions with this lady? So there's a lot of reasons that Jesus should not be talking to this woman. And church, I want you to see, Jesus doesn't care. <laughs> Jesus doesn't care about everyone's opinions on who he should be talking to. Jesus doesn't care about ethnic divides or racial divides or, or theological divides. He doesn't care about all the things that should divide us. He says, no, I'm going to go talk to people and love people. I don't care who they are. I'm coming after them. Do you see that? Oh, that we would be like that. Oh, that we would be like that. In verses 10 through 15, we see a little bit of why Jesus has come to talk to this woman. He says, would you give me something to drink? She says, oh, we can't talk to each other. And he says, if you knew who I was, you would turn around and ask me for a drink because I have living water. And the, the kind of water I offer you, if you drank from it, you would never thirst again. You would have eternal life. This is, uh, this is pro tip, masterful uh, art number one. Jesus does what I love to call a, a Jesus juke, right? He, the, she thinks that we're talking about water, and he says, hey, give me a drink. I'm the living water, right? He just turns the conversation completely around, makes it about salvation, starts talking to her about God. Church, we need to, we need to learn how to do this. We need to learn how to, in our conversations with people, just subtly make things about God. So we can talk to them about the Lord. So we can talk to them about their faith. So we can talk to them about prayer. So we can invite them to church. When somebody is talking about water, maybe you need to say, have you heard of the living water? When somebody says, hey, I can't find my keys to my car, you're like, you got the keys to the kingdom? Right? Like, we got we to gotta find those Jesus, Jesus juke moments. 
Don't be weird about it, but find ways. Jesus was good at this. I had a conversation uh, just this past week where it was over, it was in a text, a group text thing with uh, my buddies from Chicago, most of them I've known since high school. And they were arguing with each other. There are Christians and non-Christians in this group, Republicans and Democrats. It's all over the place because we're from high school. And so we've all gone different ways and different ideas. And so one of them started just kind of ranting about cancel culture. So he was saying, you know, I think it's so dumb that, that someone can take something you tweeted 10 years ago and pull that out and, and tweet it and it goes viral and now everybody hates you and everyone wants your life to be ruined and now you're fired and now you can't work anywhere ever again. So that's what he was saying. Some other people were, were texting and responding and saying, well, if somebody did something terribly wrong 10 years ago, don't you think that matters? Don't you think they should be held accountable? Don't you think they should be told they need to change, right? What, what do you think? We just, we just let everything go? And as everyone's yelling at each other and talking, I'm slowly saying things like, huh, you know, you're right. I, I, it, I wish that there was a way to look honestly at people's past mistakes. Yeah, you know, it would be good if we could, if we could look at people's past mistakes and say we need to do better and, and call people to change and, uh, you know, I don't know, repent. Uh, maybe uh, be sanctified, uh, maybe look more like Christ today than they did 10 years ago. Oh, I, I think you're right. Maybe we should hold people accountable. And oh my gosh, buddy over here, I, I think you're right. It, it shouldn't be something where when someone makes one mistake, they carry that guilt and condemnation for the rest of their life and there's no way to move forward. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to take people and say, yeah, you messed up before, but there's a way for your guilt and condemnation to come off of you. There's a way for you to pursue a better life, and there's a way for you to move forward without all of that guilt and condemnation. And everyone was like, man, I wish we could do that. And I said, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you about the gospel? Can I tell you about what he does for us on the cross? We need to learn to do this like Jesus. My mic is falling off. Give me a second. In verses 16 through 18, Jesus helps this woman to face just how thirsty her soul is. Jesus tells her, I've got living water and that's what you need. I've got it. And her response isn't, her response I almost read as like joking. She's like, oh, sir, give me this water. <laughs> but then Jesus says, go get your husband. And it almost looks like Jesus is being mean. He says, hey, go get your husband. She says, uh, well, I, I don't have a husband. Jesus doesn't just leave it there. He says, you're right, you don't have a husband. The man you're living with isn't your husband. Yikes, Jesus, what are you doing? And then Jesus says, in fact, you've had five husbands. None of that worked out. Does this sound like, picture what you think of Jesus, right? Right? He hugs lambs. Does this sound like something you would picture Jesus doing to a woman? But he, he points her right at her pain. He says, I've got living water that will satisfy your soul. And then he says, let's take a minute and remember that you haven't found what you're looking for yet. Let's take, would, would we just be honest? Can we just be honest? How is this working out for you? Have you found what you're looking for yet? Is your soul satisfied? Or have you been bouncing from one relationship to, an, to the next, to the next, to the next, looking for something and finding that every well you turn to is empty and dry? And Jesus says, friend, I, I've got what you're looking for. I've got what you're looking for. What you need is living water. Church, everybody is looking for something. Everybody you know is looking for something. Everyone is looking for something to satisfy their soul. Often it's relationship after relationship. Often it's career, right? If I could just, if I could just be that important person, oh, then my life would count and matter. Often it's material stuff. We trick ourselves into, if I could just have that bigger house, then I would be happy. If I could just, once I'm in the Tesla, then I'll be happy. Once I, once I, once I, and Jesus is saying, have you realized that that well is empty too yet? How is that working out for you? 
And friends, I think we need to, we need to get in the habit, like, like Augustine said, our souls are restless until they rest in thee, right? We need to get in the habit of pointing that out lovingly, kindly to our friends in conversations. When we notice friends chasing this after this after this, and we can, can we just find ways to ask, hey, is that working out? Are you finding what you're looking for? Is it possible your heart is longing for something that only God can satisfy? Can I, can I give you a drink of living water? Can I tell you about Jesus? Verses 19 through 25, she brings up the theological argument. I, I find this interesting because Jesus has just said, hey, I know all about your, your crazy love life. And she goes, where should we worship? You see what's happening there, right? She's like, let's not talk about this. So she brings up the hot-button theology issue between them, thinking that as a good Jewish rabbi, he's going to have to argue about that, and he's going to spend 40 minutes giving me a sermon on that, because she'd rather hear that than him talk and poke about her romance. What I love about what Jesus does here is he does give her an answer. He says, no, listen, you know, God revealed himself. He told us the temple is where it's at. But then Jesus actually disarms the moment by saying it doesn't really matter. (laughs) He says the day is coming where that mountain won't matter and that temple won't matter. God's doing something bigger. Jesus masterfully says, hey, don't don't change the subject. (laughs) This really doesn't matter. This isn't the issue. And then he says, God is looking for worshipers. He points it back to her. Are you one? Are you seeking him? Have you you really reached out? Because I've got living water. I love this. I love what we learn from the way that Jesus talks to people. He's kind. He does not let the stuff that would divide us stop him from loving someone, speaking to someone, talking to them. But he is very honest and very direct, and he knows that he's on a mission and that anything that they talk about will not be as important as her salvation. And so he finds a way in kindness to get to that conversation. And then as she tries to wiggle around, he just, are you satisfied? Have you really found what you're looking for? Because I know where it is. Would you just believe me? Don't change the subject. Let's talk about this. I think we need to, to learn something here. Okay, so with all of that said, with all of that said, I want us to look at the beginning of this story and then the end of this story. Because this story actually results in her putting her faith in Jesus and then running back to her town, and many people in her town put their faith in Jesus. So this story results in lots of people experiencing Jesus. A whole community comes to know Jesus. And so we want to ask, how does this happen? How are neighbors experiencing Jesus? Take a look with me at John 4, verse 4. It says that he had to pass through Samaria. Jesus was going from the south to the north, and he had to pass through Samaria. Friends, I want to assure you that geographically, he did not have to pass through Samaria. Just like if you're going from Texas to North Dakota, you do not have to hit South Dakota. You can, you can go all the way to California and up the West Coast and scoop around. You don't need to go through South Dakota. In fact, many Jews in Jesus' day intentionally avoided Samaria. There were two major routes that people would take to get around Samaria. Do you see them on the left and the right? I'm colorblind. That's either green or red on the left and the right. I don't know. But you you notice that they head up, and the moment they're about to leave the south, they skirt. They go up the river, or they go up the coast, and then they come back around. They avoid the middle ground entirely. Many people would do that. Many good Jews would do that, because no good Jew would be caught in Samaria. And Jesus, it says, had to go through Samaria. So I asked the question, why? What, What made him have to go through Samaria? Geographically, he didn't. But he had to go through Samaria to meet this woman. He had to go through this this town to bring her to faith. He had to go through Samaria because his mission was to reach Samaritans. And so Jesus goes through. He comes into her place of living because she needs to experience Jesus too. Verses 40 and 42 are also stunning. 
They're also stunning for us. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Not only is this good Jew passing through Samaria, now this is unheard of. A Jewish rabbi is staying in the homes of Samaritans, eating meals with them, spending his day with them. What is happening here? Friends, this is a small picture of what God does for all of us, just on a bigger scale. See, God leaves heaven to come down to the dirt with us. That's what he's done in Jesus. God has left the good place and come to the place that he couldn't go there. How scandalous. But he went to us. He came to us. This is the doctrine of the incarnation. Incarnation means in flesh, that that God has taken on human flesh to become one of us, that God came down from heaven to live here, to be with us, to get to know us, to go through our mess and our garbage, to be close. And we Christians need to be incarnational too. This is a lesson he is teaching us. Point number one today is our neighbors will experience Jesus through incarnation. Our neighbors will experience Jesus through incarnation. I want you to notice that Jesus is not holding some ministry event, right? He's walking through a town and he's going to the well for a drink. This is not some big uh, backyard picnic. He's not hosting a barbecue. He's not doing VBS. What he's doing is going where the people are. He just has a drink of water. He's going into the places that he will find people who need him. He's meeting people at the well. And church, we need to do that. We need to meet people at the water cooler at work. We need to meet people on the bleachers when when the football games are happening. We need to meet people. We need to look for opportunities. We need to say yes to them. When when there's a way for us to get involved in in the lives of people around us, we should should run into that incarnationally, thinking, I'm going to bring Jesus with me wherever I go. When a neighbor says, hey, we're doing a a barbecue, can you bring a casserole? Christians shouldn't go, oh, another thing on my to-do list. Christians should say, a way in, hooray, all right, I'll make a casserole. I'm not into that, but I'll do it because there's an opportunity here. Um, Before COVID, before COVID, my daughters were going to Green Valley Elementary School in Monrovia. And at the beginning of the school year, there was a parent orientation day, and it was either Christy or me, and I don't know if we did paper, rock, scissors, or or whatever, but I I ended up going. So I went to this parent orientation, and for a couple hours, the teachers and principals, they talked to us about bus routes, and like, you know, don't send your kids to school if they're dying of the plague. Well, uh, they, they, you know, they just give you the the regular stuff, right? Here's what happens if your kid uh, gets in a lot of trouble, we'll call you in, we'll will make you sign a non-disclosure agreement, yada, yada. So they eventually made a huge appeal. They said, hey, parents, we need substitutes. We are desperate for substitute teachers. Every week, there are at least two spots that we need subs and we don't have enough subs. And so we end up with like guidance counselors doing three things, trying to be in multiple places at once. We end up with teachers doing too much and, and we need subs. And there was this moment where I think the Lord stirred something in my heart, and I thought, oh, what a cool way for Christians to be involved in the community. Why aren't more Christians doing this? I I should get people at my church to do this. Wow, who should do this? God, this is a cool idea. You're right. All those people should do this. And then uh, a couple moments went by and they said, if you're perhaps a stay-at-home parent, this would be perfect for you. And I thought, oh, not, not all those people, my wife. My wife could do this. I should totally tell her she should do this. And then they said, or even if you have a pretty regular job, but you've got like Fridays off or something. And I went, oh, I'm the man. Oh, no, the Lord has been stirring this up and pointing the finger at me because I've got Fridays off as a pastor. Oh, no. So uh, I signed up to be a substitute teacher. I went through all the stuff, jumped through all these hurdles, got fingerprinted, all that stuff, went through training and orientation. Uh, I finally was allowed to be a sub in January of 2020. (laughs) Church, I I helped with one field trip, 
and I subbed twice. And then COVID. Uh, but listen, listen. On that field trip, one of the teachers was stressed out of her mind. And I, I got to just talk to her, tell her everything's going to be all right, right? Like, what's the worst that could happen? Everything's going to be okay. If that kid touches poop, everything will be, we were at a farm. I was like, everything's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. We'll wash their hands. And then I said, hey, can I just, can I pray with you? Would that be helpful? And she was like, yes, please. So I prayed for her. Then, while I was substitute teaching, I'm actually in the school, and church, I'm not like standing up on the cafeteria table preaching the gospel. They would never ask me back. But, but I was, you know, I'm cutting something and getting prepared, and another teacher walks into the lounge and says, uh, hey, you're new, what's your name? I tell her my name, and they're like, what are you, what are you doing later today? And I said, oh, I've, I've got church, it's Wednesday, so I'm going to go help with uh, youth group students and yada yada. And they were like, oh, church, where do you go? And I'm talking to them about church. I'm not saying that suddenly someone has become a Christian because of this, but I have no idea what praying for that teacher has done for her. I have no idea if maybe she grew up in the church and longs for a relationship with God and has felt kind of distant from God, and then maybe that was the first time she prayed in a long time. Who knows what that might have done in her life? Who knows? Who knows? And that's the point. We don't know. We just need to get out there where people are and be Christians. Amen? We just got to go. We just got to go get in the community and be kind, good, nice people. And, and Pastor Tim was telling me this week that we all need to realize that these opportunities are everywhere. They're everywhere around us. And some of you are already in them. And, and what you don't need to do, you don't need to find them. What you need to do is have a mindset shift that makes you realize, oh, when I'm coaching Little League, this is an opportunity for me to represent Jesus. I don't mean you need to lead a Bible study with your team, but maybe you should get to know the parents, invite them to church, love them, pray for them, hear about a need, go meet that need in the name of Jesus. Amen? The second little thing, and this is quick, this is short, is in verses 28 through 30. After this woman believes in Jesus, verse 28, so the woman left she left her water jar and went away into town. That's important. She left her water jar because she had had a drink from the living water. Amen? She left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming to him. She meets Jesus, she experiences him, and then she runs home and says, everyone, come and see. Come and see. This is amazing. You need to experience this. Come and see. Come with me. And church, point number two, this is the last point today. Our neighbors will experience Jesus through incarnation and through invitation. Come and see what's going on in this place. She invites people to rush back to the well with her, and they meet Jesus there. So not only is Jesus chasing people down where they're at, but people are being invited to find Jesus where he's at. When I was in eighth grade, ninth grade, somewhere in there, my, um, my friend Jose used to, we were, we were best buds, he used to come over all the time, and we were angsty, like, rebellious teens, and so we would swear all the time and we would yell at each other. That was like the boy love language, right? Like, oh, you're such an idiot, ha, 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 ha. You know, oh, this smells horrible, smell it. You know, like, just, like, not building each other up, but somehow bonding. So we'd play video games and, and just be mean to each other. And he starts, his mom forces him to go to a Bible study. <laughs> he starts going to this Bible study, and Jose meets Jesus. Jose experiences God. Jose becomes a believer. And Jose keeps coming over to my house. He keeps, in, he keeps coming and hanging out with me. This is incarnation, right? And as he's showing up in my house, in my life, and hanging out with me, he's just acting different. He's acting weird. He's not swearing as much, and then eventually he's not swearing at all, and it seems weird, like, why are you changing? And then instead of like being like, you're such an idiot, he's, he's, saying, things like, he's saying things like, man, that's so cool that you know how to do that. And I'm like, what? what? Man, what is this? this is weird. And he's like, uh, hey, man, how, how are you? How are you doing? And I'm like, why do you, what is this? And, but somewhere in there, there's a part of me that feels like, why do, what is happening here? What is going on with him? 
he cares about me, and this is awkward. <laughs> this eighth grade, ninth grade guy wondering what's happening. And then Jose starts inviting me to come to Bible study. Come to Bible study. Hey, you should come to Bible study. Hey, you should come to Bible study. Hey, you should. Church, he invited me for like six or nine months. And I kept saying, no, no, that sounds stupid. That sounds dumb. I don't want to go to your dumb Bible study. Finally, I went. Finally, I went, and it was so crucial in my life that I went because Jose was showing me that I was missing something, but at that time in his life, Jose actually wasn't very good at communicating the gospel. He wasn't sure how to compellingly tell me, but he brought me to a place where there was a youth pastor who was good at it, (laughs) and we opened the Bible together, and I heard. And so, church, we need both of these. As we move forward, we need both. We need to go out into our communities and look like Jesus and act like Jesus and love like Jesus and talk about Jesus. We also need to say, come and see, come and see, come see what's going on here. Because this is a time, this is a time where many people will clearly hear, you guys have been listening to me for over 25 minutes right now, talk about Jesus. Come and see, come and see, come hear about Jesus. So we need both of these. As we look to the future, I want to give us just a couple. These aren't major revelations. Uh, It's nothing as big as two services. But I want to share a little bit of how, as we move forward, this is going to be on our mind, that the goal of our neighbors experiencing Jesus is going to drive what we're doing here. And so uh, I have a slide for this. Three things. First, we're, we're going to have a neighbor mindset in everything we do. So I'm going to work with all of our ministry leaders and ministry teams to ask, okay, with this ministry, with this ministry, how is this ministry perceived by our neighbors? How is this ministry inviting neighbors in to come and see? And how is this ministry kind of getting out of its zone and and getting into the community and reaching people, right? So we're going to think in every way about that. How is the children's ministry getting out there? And how's the children's ministry saying, hey, come on in here? And how are our home groups doing that? Speaking of home groups, uh, we want to have a renewed uh, focus on our home groups. We really want to build them back up. We know that over COVID, some stopped meeting for a time, and others feel like, well, we're meeting, but we don't exactly know what to do. And so we're, we're together. We're going to be aiming at some goals and working together. And one of the things that we talked about last week is that our home groups are going to go through seasons and cycles where they're regularly thinking, okay, we meet around here, how can we pick something near where we meet that we're just going to go and, and do good things for people? Maybe your home group picks a park in the neighborhood, and you just show up at the park with some water bottles and some things, and you're kind to people, and that's it. Maybe that's it. Or maybe your home group picks a neighbor that needs some help with yard work, and you go and you serve them. But our home groups will be thinking through this lens. And we're also, church, almost every day that I'm here uh, working in the office, I'm working on sermon slides or sermon points or whatever, and I just hear, whack, 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 whack. There are houses being built like crazy in our backyard, right here, right next door. And so we're going to have an emphasis on these new homes. As people are moving in, we're going to be there with the welcome mat saying, we love you, we're here, we'd love to serve you, how can we help you, come and see, and we're here, right? We just want to have a focus on the people coming in because God loves them and we need to show them that. Amen? As we wrap up today, I want to invite you just in a moment of reflection to think back on who it was that brought you to church or brought you to faith in Jesus. This may have been today (laughs) or this may have been 45 years ago, right? But who was it? Who led you to that next step or invited you in? As you think about that person, I want to encourage you to consider that God wants you to be that person in the lives of many, many people. God wants to use you to do something similar. And so as we move into the future, we're going to have that mindset and be praying that. And some of you are here today uh, or listening online, whether it's today or 10 years from now, and you need a drink of this living water that Jesus has. Some of you have resonated with the story of this woman because she has gone from relationship to relationship to relationship and still not found what she's looking for. Empty well after empty well after empty well and there's got to be more. There's just got to be more to this life. And if you feel that way, friend, remember the words of Augustine, 
Our souls are restless till they rest in thee. What you are looking for is the living water that you can only find in Jesus. Because what you're looking for is not found in this world. But Jesus, what he has done is he has brought heaven down to us and he has reconciled us to God so that we can have a relationship with the giver of life and never be thirsty again. And he does that through his death on the cross where he takes our sin the stuff that is causing all of the problem between us and God, the judgment we deserve, he takes all of that and he dies to put it to death, to pay for it and take it away from you. And he offers us new life. The way we receive it is not by being good enough. The way we receive it is trusting that he did enough for us. And so if you need living water today, I'm telling you it is available, it is here. What are you waiting for? Have you found what you're looking for yet? It's in Jesus. I'm going to close this in prayer. And if you need Jesus to save you today, you can pray this prayer. It's not a magic prayer or special words, but it expresses a belief in what Jesus has done, and that's what matters. I'll lead you in that prayer. And if you already know Jesus, I invite you to do what we've been doing for a few weeks. Pray this over someone. Ask God to lead someone you know to meet Jesus in a saving way. Let's pray. God, something in me realizes that you're what I'm looking for. And I realize now that it's my own sin that has kept me from you. I trust in Jesus' death and resurrection to save me, give me forgiveness, and make me right with you. Help me this very day to live that new life. Help me to learn more about you and walk closer and closer with you every day. And that's it. Lord, the rest of us, we all together pray that you would move in our lives and use us. Help us to to always have this mindset of reaching our neighbors, letting them experience you through us. Help us to see the opportunities you give us to run into the community, to be a part of what people are doing, and help us also to take the opportunities boldly and kindly to invite our friends and neighbors and families to come and see what you're up to here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, go ahead and stand with me. Get some of that stretching in. Get those legs worked out. I just have a few announcements for you today. The first one, as usual, is that registration for Sunday uh, will go out on Tuesday. Um, please be registering. Folks at home, if you haven't come uh, for a long time, we really encourage you to come and sign up and, and be here. There's still some spaces available. I will remind us that as you come in um, next Sunday, Try and find a place that accommodates the size of your group. Um, We want to make sure that we respect the social distancing stuff. So um, work really hard at being neighborly in that way. Uh, Thank you for continuing to tithe. Ministry is still happening at church. And so please continue to do that. You can do that uh, through various ways, uh, some of which are digital and you can see there. Please continue to do that. The Lord's work is continuing and you are a blessing uh, when you do that. Uh, There is a new to Greenridge class. It's going to start next Sunday, May 2nd. Uh, Pastor Tim is going to be teaching that. It will be on Zoom. If you're interested in learning more about Greenridge, please take this class. It's super helpful. Uh, Tim does a wonderful job of walking you through some historical stuff, some theological stuff, getting to know you a little bit more and getting to letting, letting you know us a little bit more. This class is also required for membership. So if you're thinking about becoming a member, you can take this class and, and see what that's all about. I want to give you a commission today. It comes from Romans chapter 12. And as you think about being incarnational in your neighborhood, taking Jesus into the places where you live and work, that's what these verses are about. Hear these, and then you're dismissed. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You're dismissed, church.